Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 46, verses 1 through 11. That's basically the entire psalm. And uh, you can find that in your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along on page 517 in the Old Testament section. Actually, in any Bible, if you ever want to find the Psalms really fast, all you do is hold the Bible up like this and open it to what looks like exactly the middle of the Bible, and most likely, you'll be in the book of Psalms, and then you just find Psalm 46. The Psalms are at the heart of the Bible in many, many different ways. So Psalm 46, 1 through 11. To the leader of the Korahites... According to Alamot, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every summer for the past four years, we as a congregation have delved deeply into the book of Psalms. By now, some of you may remember from prior years that I always start off this sermon series by preaching on the psalm that corresponds to my current age. Two weeks ago was my 46th birthday, so this year we start our series looking at Psalm 46. By the way, if you've ever wanted to start reading the psalms or go deeper into the psalms but you're not sure where to start, that's a great approach. Pick the year that represents how old you are and start there. I guarantee you that unless you are 152 years old, there is a psalm that corresponds to your age. Now, I can't guarantee that it will be a nice, beautiful, or comforting psalm, so don't take it as a prediction of how your year will go. The psalms represent the entire spectrum of human emotions even some pretty horrible human emotions. But Psalm 46, the one we're looking at this morning, happens to be a great psalm, one of the favorites of all time for many people, right up there with the 23rd Psalm, which we all know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You all know Psalm 46 too, right? You can quote it by heart. Anyone know? Raise your hand if you know all the words to Psalm 46 by by heart. Raise your hand if you know any of the words to Psalm 46 by heart. Actually, if I started singing, you might. If the sky that we look upon should tumble and fall. Come on now. And the mountains should crumble to the sea. No, I won't be afraid. No, I won't be afraid just as long. As you stand. You know more of Psalm 46 than you thought you did. You see, we just sang verses 2 and 3 and a loose paraphrase of verses 7 and 11. When Ben E. King sat down to put these words to music, the music was his own. But the words came from an old spiritual 
that was essentially a musical rendition of Psalm 46. And so when the song says, as long as you stand by me, the you in the original version, that's a capital Y, that's you, God, not darling, darling, but you, God, as long as you, God, stand by me, I will not be afraid, I will not cry. And that is the message of Psalm 46 in a nutshell. And a reminder that the Psalms have always inspired some of the best and greatest music in every generation and every culture. So Psalm 46 is about remembering that God stands by us in times of trouble. Like many of the Psalms, it begins with a set of instructions right there before verse 1. Those are important. They indicate that it was almost certainly used for musical worship in the original temple in Jerusalem. So it begins with an ascription. It's addressed to the leader. Presumably, that's the worship leader in the temple. And it is a psalm of the Korahites. The Korahites were a musical family who composed many of the psalms in the book of Psalms. This psalm is meant to be sung according to alamot. And we're not really sure what alamot is. It's one of those words that uh, we just don't know. But some scholars suspect that the word alma in Hebrew is the word for a young girl. And so alamot, which would be the plural of that word, even though it doesn't really show up in other places, it could mean that this was a song meant to be sung by a women's chorus or maybe by the young women of the congregation. In the last instruction, we read, quite obviously, this is a song. Getting into the body of the psalm, it's divided into three sections, each one ending with the cryptic, untranslatable word, selah. That's also another word that we have no idea what it means. It could be some sort of musical instruction. It could be an indication of where the verse ends. Rabbis and biblical scholars have been debating the meaning of this word ever since there have been rabbis and biblical scholars, and we still just don't know. It's a mystery. Then there's a refrain, a chorus, in each verse. In verses 2 and verses 3, it shows up at the very end, and it also shows up in verse 1, but at the very beginning of the passage with slightly different wording. And the chorus, or the refrain, that echoes through this psalm is simply this, God is with us. God is our refuge. So the first section of Psalm 46 expounds on that theme. Specifically, God is present with us. God is in the midst of what we would call natural disasters. So though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, all of those things were real and very present fears and dangers to people in the ancient world. If you think about it, they still are for us today. Earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, forest fires, avalanches, volcanic eruptions. I mean, for most people who don't live in El Paso, those are real and present dangers. But I'm sure we have our own types of natural disasters, things which, despite all of our technology, despite all of our knowledge and progress, are still just outside of our ability to stop or control natural disasters. Psalm 46 remind us that God is present with us in the midst of those sorts of things. By the way, plagues, viruses, pandemics, I would lump all of those things together in the category of natural disasters. Now, the second part of the psalm, the second section or movement, declares that God is also present in what we might call man-made disasters. Even as the nations are in uproar, God is in the midst of the city. The kingdoms totter. So once again, political turmoil was a real fear and a real danger to people in the ancient world. And if you followed the news this year or any year for the last 500 to 1,000 years, you know that that is still a real and present concern for us today. Riots, wars, violence, people generally acting horribly to one another. Man-made 
disasters. And they can be just as devastating as natural disasters. But Psalm 46 reminds us that God is present with us in the midst of all these things too. Now it's tempting to ask the question, okay, where is God in the midst of all these things? And if God is truly present with us, why doesn't God intervene? Why doesn't he actually do something to help us? Why doesn't he stop those natural disasters or man-made disasters from harming us? It's a great question. It's worth asking, and it's worth some careful reflection. I approach a lot of difficult questions through the lens of being a parent. Many of you, like me, are parents of children, and often when my children encounter difficult, hard things in this life, I have the ability to intervene, to step in and solve all of their problems. And sometimes, depending on what kind of problem it is, that's exactly what I do. But if I did that all the time for every problem, I would not be doing them a favor. And so sometimes, instead of stepping in to solve a problem, I stand by my children. I do everything I can to advise them, to encourage them, to give them strength for what they are facing. And when they then succeed, I rejoice with them, and they rejoice a whole lot more than if I had actually solved the problem for them. But sometimes they don't succeed, so when they fail, when the problem is too hard for them to handle, I comfort them, I grieve with them, and I remind myself that even through adversity, my children will grow, they will learn humility, they will learn resilience, and they will learn compassion for others. So, where is God in our times of trouble? Sometimes God is actively intervening on our behalf, whether we recognize it or not. And sometimes God is standing by us, sheltering us and strengthening us so that we can stand on our own. A couple of years ago, on a Saturday morning, I was here at the church getting ready for the Sunday that was coming when news broke that there had been a mass shooting event near Cielo Vista Mall. Many of you remember that day and probably where you were and what you were doing when that happened. And like so many parents that day, my first instinct, my instant concern was to call my family to make sure that my children were in the safest place I know, our place of shelter, our place of refuge, our home. I think for the children of Israel who first sang this song, the temple in Jerusalem, often referred to as the house of the Lord, was a place just like that. In a turbulent political environment, it was their place of refuge and comfort and safety. Our modern word sanctuary for what this building is actually reflects that. The word sanctuary can and does refer to a place of worship, a sacred place, but it's evolved beyond that to mean a place of safety in general. We have wildlife sanctuaries, safe places for certain types of wildlife. To seek sanctuary is to seek shelter and protection from anything that is threatening us. And so that idea of the sanctuary, the refuge, the home, that's the refrain that's echoed throughout Psalm 46. Now I'm mindful of the fact that both in man-made disasters and in natural disasters, not everyone makes it safely home. Houses, temples, sanctuaries, even mountains can crumble and fall into the sea. And so Psalm 46 reminds us that our true refuge is not a building made with human hands, but rather the one who stands by us, God himself. As God's children, we believe that our greatest refuge, our greatest shelter is not even in this world at all. Even at the end of our days, God stands by us and then God carries us to our heavenly home. And we believe that a day will come 
in the words of the third and final section of Psalm 46, when God will make all wars cease, when God will break the bow and shatter the spear, when everyone will come to behold the works of the Lord. Verse 10, near the end of this psalm, famously says, be still and know that I am God. This is probably one of the most oft-quoted passages in the book of Psalms. You find it framed in people's houses on coffee mugs and t-shirts and everything else. Be still and know that I'm God. That Hebrew word that's translated as be still is rafa. It can mean be still, but I think an even better translation, and in fact, this is the first translation that shows up if you look up the word in Strong's Hebrew Concordance, and that word is relax, followed by let go. In other words, let go of all the things that frighten you, of all the things over which you ultimately have no control. And why should you do this? Also, verse 10, because, says God, I am exalted, literally that means higher or above, over all the nations. That's that category of man-made disasters, violence, warfare, things like that. God is above all of those things. And I am exalted, higher or above, over all the earth, that category of natural disasters and cataclysms. God is in control over all of those things. Now, Psalm 46 is not a promise that our lives will be free from those things, free from trouble, free from strife, or even free from death. But Psalm 46 is a promise that in all of those things, we are not alone. And none of those things are the end of the story. When we work hard and fight to make the world a better place, God is with us. When we succeed and when we fail, God is with us. And when our struggles in this world at last are over, well, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, our sanctuary, our safe place our home, Selah, which quite plausibly could mean something like, thanks be to God. 